are now halfway through this series on the six paramitas or the six perfections. And today we're diving into patience. Um, and I think it's safe to say that today's world really does not foster um, a conducive environment to develop this virtue. And you know, now the average attention span can't can no longer even pause to really read an entire news article or enjoy long form video. We just kind of skim headlines and digest content in 15 second videos. So to really develop patience in this day and age, uh, it really requires a radical change of attitude that is different from what society has designed for us. And there's so much emphasis on efficiency and immediacy. And this is really fueled by sort of um, an attitude of despair where we feel like we don't have enough time. But in this state of impatience, we're so focused on what we're trying to gain now that it seems we're not really aware of what we're losing. And I think what we lose and sacrifice is uh, quality and depth and ironically, we seem to lose time. We lose the now because we're acting from a place of really deep and sticky resistance. Uh, we're resisting what's actually happening now and in the larger sense, the, the true nature of reality. Um, and most recently, I was thinking about how this pandemic is uh, such a collective test of our patience. Um, not only, uh, you know, some of us are uh, might be thriving in the isolation and quietude, but some of us are really impatiently waiting for life to get back to normal. And, and maybe a lot of us are kind of oscillating in both states. Um, and also as the pandemic continues, we need to develop patience to develop tolerance for others who might hold a very different and extreme uh, opinion on issues that are important to us. Um, and in terms of our practice, uh, I was thinking how the Sutra path is all about a more obvious application of patience where you process and digest teachings in a very cumulative manner. But Tantra is the accelerated path and it's all about urgency to achieve enlightenment within as few lifetimes as possible. It's also about the urgency of impermanence where we really don't know how much life we have to practice. So we are here to ask Punsok to um, go more in depth on this virtue and also how we can apply patience to our practice and how we can balance so that we're not uh, using patience as an excuse to you know, go into complacency and laziness and also be able to temper the productive energy we need to move forward. Um, so with that, Kunsokla, please. <laughs> ah, beautiful, thank you. And by the way, the beautiful words in the email that was sent out uh, entirely, that was uh, Liz's, came from Liz's mind onto, onto what? We used to say onto paper, but we don't do it say onto paper anymore. <laughs> Onto the screen. All right. Oh my goodness, this is so unprecedented. We are on time. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's not waste the on time that we have. <laughs> or we begin with a very simple meditation, a more in the uh, uh, tradition of Mahamudra or I guess somewhat Dzogchen. I'm not an official practitioner of Dzogchen. That's not, that's not in my lineage. Uh, but I do do practices that are similar to Dzogchen practices. You know, uh, we all, every tradition in some sense or another, there's a point where their practices merge. They just have them, they just give them different names, use different vocabulary for them. Okay. And this is, uh, Dzogchen, you say Mahamudra, is not trying to change anything. It comes from, you meditate with 
you meditate with a with with an understanding that uh, the aim of meditation is already here. And there are many different kind of approaches you can take. Like for example, from a very obvious kind of approach, the true nature of reality is already in the very reality that you're experiencing. So it is the very reality that you're experiencing that will give you that, that has the door to the ultimate nature that we are seeking. So there's no need to put away our experiences so we can have an experience of, of ultimate nature, for example, that we just allow whatever is happening to, allow, to happen, what, what we engage it with a state of mind of there's already the ultimate nature of reality already in this experience that I'm having. In being annoyed, in being bored, in being surprised, in looking, in the thoughts that are happening, in the very distraction that may be happening, if we are able to maintain a sort of a, a, a sense of perspective, it's already in this experience that I'm having right now. So that's the attitude of the, of the you could say that's the sort of summary of the meditation of Mahamudra, Dzogchen, those kinds of high practices. Okay. All right, so we're gonna do something, something like that. Okay. So first, have, have a nice communication with your body that you're going to meditate. Allow the intelligence within you that already know what is meditation. It already knows that. What is meditation? To allow it to say, oh, okay, we're going to meditate. I don't know what that is. So we don't have to impose on the body, impose on our, on our mind. This is what meditation is, and you're going to go in there whether you like it or not. Just invite them. You know what meditation is? Let's get there. Let's go there. And the mind says, yeah, all right, let's go. And your body's saying, whoo, I've been waiting all day. <laughs> and, and your body tells you, okay, how are you going to meditate? Okay, all right. All right. So you sit, sit, okay, be comfortable in your seat like this. Oh, yeah, okay, good, good. Make sure your spine is upright, but don't be uptight. Oh, good, good. Let your arms be loose like loose rags, but comfortable. Keep making adjustments. That's the intelligence in the body guiding you, okay? It's not distraction. Until you arrive at a, an experience in the body where that intelligence says, yeah, that's it. This will help us get into meditation. And you just stay there. You try to, you try to stay in it. You feel it in the head and neck. You feel it in the mouth. You feel it in your eyes. That you're touching calm and peace. You're touching joy. You're touching clarity and radiance. You're touching collectiveness. And these very experiences that you're having experiences coming through your senses, experiences coming through internally, subjectively from your mind, they're all being qualified by being, approaching the meditative state. There's, if you allow yourself, you will notice there's a, you're hearing slightly different than you were before that intention to meditate. Your thoughts are being experienced slightly different than when they were uh, before you made that intention. So stay with that understanding, stay with that perspective and, com and continue to allow that state to be. And this is a strange thought to hold. I'm gonna ask you to hold for the, for the duration of the meditation, that's all you're gonna do, hold. You're gonna hold on to this thinking. I'm going to let you know what that thinking is once we are off nicely ready. The intelligence in my body tell me to fix the cushion. <laughs> Did I fix the cushion? Oh, yeah, there it is right there. Oh, yeah, I have found ah, in the body. 
because I have found ah in the body, the breath will sit in that ah. And the mind will be attracted to that ah. So the sense of calming and peace is enhanced a little bit and continuously being enhanced. The sense of joy is being enhanced from a mere pleasantness to have some sort of ecstatic approaching some sort of ecstatic experience. The very space of mind is becoming clearer, making thoughts and perceptions even more distinct. The luminosity of the mind is becoming brighter, making experiences have more, viv have more vividness and loudness. And the mind scatteredness is withdrawing from being scattered and, and slowly collecting itself. Continue to allow that to take place. And it's nice to sort of have some sort of signature move internally, externally. I use the breath where it sort of seals the my commitment to intermeditation. What I do, I do a conscious breath. I've been breathing, of course. <laughs> now you're gonna do it consciously. One big conscious breath in through the nose, hold for a second or two, and then completely relax. Let yourself dive into that space that is that you're touching already. It's like I'm about to, there's meditation, it's attractive. It's peaceful, it's joyful, it's clear, it's bright, it's focused, it's attractive, and I'm right in front of it, and I'm about to dive into it, commit myself to, to it. So I feel readiness in my body. Rejoice. I feel readiness in my breath. Rejoice. I feel a kind of readiness in my mind, rejoice. And now that commitment breath in through the nose, gently, fully. And let go, let go, let go, let go. And as you let go, feel the letting go in the body physically, feel the letting go in the body energetically, feel the letting go mentally, let it go, let go, let go. Feel yourself going deeper into the calm, deeper into that space of pleasantness, deeper into that space of clarity, radiance, focus. Keep letting go, keep letting go, keep letting go until the out breath reaches its platform, reaches its base, and naturally by itself, let it come back. And as it come back, stay in the space where it brought you into. And with each out breath, as you feel the collapsing, let yourself go deeper into that space of calm, pleasantness, where inner sensations are gaining clarity, distinctiveness, vividness. And we immediately remember, this is my mind's clarity. This is the, my mind's luminosity. And as you continue to breathe, let the breathing be like a stabilizing, cruising sort of effect. Where you're stabilizing yourself in, the, in that space called meditation. And there will be, in the beginning, experiences which are very similar to experiences outside of meditation. Don't let those experiences make you conclude that, ah, I must be out of meditation. And you try to force yourself to go back into meditation. But consider them to be similar experiences, like visiting a new neighborhood and there's a Starbucks there. Does that mean you're back in your old neighborhood with the same Starbucks? No, you're in a new neighborhood that also has a Starbucks. Starbucks is not paying me for saying Starbucks. <laughs> okay. And you feel 
that you're going naturally going deeper into that state. And that's what you're going to be doing, just allowing that state, allowing the calm to become calmer, the pleasantness to become more pleasant, the clarity through those very sensations to become clearer, connect you closer to luminosity, allowing the mind to be more and more collective, more and more collected. See, there's nothing to, that needs to be done. And within that space, without disturbing the peace, without disturbing those qualities, gently, like a skilled fish moving through the water without disturbing the water, a, sk a skilled diver diving into the water without making too much waves. So gently move your mind, your attention to the space in front of you at the level of your eyebrows. And once your attention there, you begin to feel a sensation in the forehead, maybe. Ascribe to that intent, to that sensation, several things. The natural capacity of the mind to focus, you're experiencing it. What is causing that sensation? The presence of your potential, enlightened potential. In that presence, you can communicate with it, you can relate with it. So relate. And as you relate with it, notice the peace becoming more peaceful, the calm becoming calmer, the pleasant becoming more pleasant. Relate with a sense of having deep respect for it, knowing that this is your own enlightenment and the process of eventually abiding in it, being it. So respect that, trust that. In whatever form it may have appeared in your life as a person, as a personality from the past, a personality here in your life, respect that, trust it, and be grateful for the guidance and the protection that you have received thus far and that you will continue to receive. And some of you may have felt a brightness in that space in front of you. If you have not, you can imagine a brightness. And the brightness is a form taken by your enlightened potential. That form is not your enlightened potential, but are simply a means of communication. And because it is so transcendental, it's like you're with your enlightened potential. So with understanding these two, see how they are not contradictory, then take that presence to the crown of your head with the understanding I'm about to have a direct encounter with my enlightened potential as a guide. And when that light enters your heart, simply let go. And what is that? attitude you're going to have, what is the thought you're going to hold,
look at your experience and tell yourself, um, I don't feel enlightened. And you're going to tell yourself, I'm not relaxed enough. Let me relax. And you look again. Mm, am I enlightened yet? Okay, I'm not enlightened yet. All right, let me relax. That's what you're going to keep doing, back and forth. And as you do that, the state of the meditation will enhance, the calm will enhance, and so on and so forth. And this won't take for, won't, we won't hold it for too long. And for those who want, who, for whom a visual will help, you can imagine that the heart in your heart, the light in your heart, is there's a sense of a distance. And you, as you relax, you are approaching it closer and closer. You want to eventually be completely become that light. But for some reason, when you relax and check, am I enlightened? And there is that, oh, oh, I'm not. And then you relax. And as you relax, you go deeper. Okay. Now you're on your own.
Oh, Punsok, you are on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Just keep relaxing. No matter what arises, have the understanding that every experience is an opportunity to encounter ultimate reality because every experience is arising from ultimate reality. It's arising from this fundamental luminous luminosity. Okay, the experience is coming in the next second. You missed it? Okay, the next second. Did you miss that one too? Okay, just relax. Get ready for the next moment. Oh, you almost had it. Okay, now relax, get yourself ready. It's going to be in the very next moment. All right, get ready to come out of the meditation. Notice you're meditating, rejoice, and get ready to come out. Take a nice deep breath. and slowly reconnect with your immediate surroundings, reconnect with your sense of touch, sense of hearing, deliberately, consciously, and sense of sight. Okay. And when it comes to the, uh, the perfection of patience, especially, I'm not gonna say it's something that we Westerners or we modern people have a difficult time understanding. Uh, difficult time to, uh, difficult, uh, difficulties in implementing. Everyone in every age, as a matter of fact, that's why it was, it, uh, there's a, there's a, Maharatnakuta Sutra, that's the sutra that I was trying to remember last time. Uh, uh, and it, it, it is translated, some parts of it is translated by this, uh, uh, actually the, the person who, I think we invited my teacher to come to the United States. Uh, uh, he, uh, with some group of his translators, translated uh, parts of it. Uh, I think it's called a Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. I think it's called that. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, in that, where there's a place where the Buddha is talking about, uh, uh, remember, uh, uh, the, the ethics of a bodhisattva. Yeah. And in there, it's in the chapter called Definitive Vinaya. Vinaya is the, is the Sanskrit term that means discipline or the practice of ethics. Okay? So the, the Definitive Vinaya. And in there, the Buddha is making contrast between uh, the ethics of ordinary people, the ethics of someone who is uh, seeking personal liberation, and the ethics of a bodhisattva. And in there, 
uh, I have, I'm going to read something for, from that. Okay, you're going to be amazed. And so it's, it's a good thing that it's I have I, it's not my own words anymore. <laughs> so it's, uh, what you're saying makes no sense. I want the actual source. Here's the source. Okay, <laughs> this is from the uh, Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. Okay, and uh, this is the chapter where uh, the Buddha is talking about the Buddhist, the ethics of the Bodhisattva. In there, the well honored one, and uh, the well honored one is the Buddha, and then his, uh, it was questioned by uh, one of his disciples named Upali. Upali asked the Buddha, well honored one, suppose a Bodhisattva breaks a precept out of desire, another does so out of hatred, and still another does so out of ignorance. So these are the three poisons, right? Desire, hatred, and ignorance. So if you have three bodhisattvas, three bodhisattvas, not just three ordinary people, not three bodhisattvas, uh, uh, and each one of them uh, uh, breaks, does something unethical, does something, uh, uh, a bad deed, <laughs> motivated by one of these uh, poisons. So which one is worse? So we're honored one, which one of the three offenses is most serious? Listen to the answer. And this is why uh, I keep uh, what people coming from a misunderstanding about Buddhism. Uh, it's not that Buddhism doesn't say desire, there's a problem with desire, but people misunderstand what does that mean, right? So people try to avoid all kinds of desire, especially uh, the, the kind of attachment that we, like, uh, you have for your spouse, the kind of attachment you feel for your children, you know, for your friends. Am I, am I supposed to let go of that kind of attachment? So there's kind of a confusion there, right? right? So here is from the sutra, somewhat answering that question. So the well honored one answered Upali, if while practicing the Mahayana, Okay, here's the condition. While practicing the Mahayana, a Bodhisattva continues to break precepts out of desire for kalpas as numerous as the sands of the Ganges. Kalpas means eons, ages of planets, okay, ages, okay. In any way you can consider, you will uh, want, want to understand the word kalpa. Some of you already understand that. It's not a Buddhist term, okay? But it means an age, right? Like the age of the Roman Empire, that's gone, okay? That's like a kalpa, okay? Or the age of humans, of dinosaurs, that's like a kalpa, also an age, consider it an age, okay? So that's a very long time. Many people are born and die during an age, right? So for kalpas, for ages as numerous as the sands of the Ganges, his offense is still minor. If a Bodhisattva breaks precepts out of hatred, even just once, his offense is very serious. Why? Because a Bodhisattva who breaks precepts out of desire still whole sentient beings in his embrace. Whereas a bodhisattva who breaks precepts out of hatred forsakes sentient beings altogether. Okay, so Upali, a bodhisattva should not be afraid of the passions which can in some way help him to hold sentient beings in his embrace. So if you're feeling attached to your, your best friend, your spouse, your lover, your children, and that kind of attachment is helping you establish strong connections with sentient beings, it's okay. You're not supposed to, of course, it's not gonna take you to enlightenment, but it's definitely not gonna break your path, break you or take you out of the path. But you should fear the passion which can cause them to forsake sentient beings. 
Now, why should a bodhisattva fear anything that will cause that bodhisattva to forsake sentient beings? What is the bodhisattva practicing? The bodhisattva is someone who's practicing basically one thing. So there are 200 and some 50 something uh, vows if you are a full, if, if you're an ordained, if you're in ordination, okay? Some are 250. And then if you take uh, tantric uh, precepts, there's like, I don't know, like a hundred of them, okay? And if you take bodhisattva vows, there's like, there's the 18 root, there's the 40, the, the, the secondaries, there's a, what well, you could say there's a bunch of them. <laughs> okay. And you can't remember the list of each one of them. Okay, there's that. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Don't do that. And there's the 10 one, 10 non-virtues. And there's the common, there's the uncommon. So as far as the bodhisattva is concerned, you don't have 200 and you don't have 200 or 300 or 1,000 precepts. You have but one precept. What is that precept? Bodhicitta. That's your sole precept. So whatever, bodhis, whatever bodhicitta compels you to do, if you don't do it, you're breaking your precept. Even if what your bodhicitta is compelling you to do is contrary to what is considered to be normal in society. Okay, if your bodhicitta compels you to do it and you don't do it, you're breaking your precepts. That's it. And when you up, when you are uh, compelled to do something because of bodhicitta, and you do it, you are you are being virtuous. So that's a sign of the virtue, whether a bodhisattva is being virtuous or not virtuous, whether a bodhisattva is being ethical or unethical. And to put it in a way that is not quite exactly, but if I put it in this way, you will somewhat understand it. That is, if we act from a place of selfless compassion, if that's what compels us to act, we are being ethical. If we are compelled not to do something because of the selfless compassion, we are being ethical. And when we are compelled by compassion to act, when we refuse to act, we are breaking our, we are being unethical as far as the Bodhisattva is concerned. And that's why uh, in, in that particular chapter about uh, the ethics of the Bodhisattva, the Buddhist Buddha says, uh, the ethic of the Bodhisattva is very relative because in keeping Bodhicitta, in keeping, in keeping the, the, uh, the call of, of great compassion with one person, you may, be, you may need to do something that you may not need to do with someone else. So it's not just one thing you're supposed to be doing no matter who you encounter, but rather you're supposed to keep an attitude no matter what you're doing with any, anyone you encounter. That's the ethics of the Bodhisattva. And when keep, keeping this in mind, so since the only practice that the Bodhisattva is doing is Bodhicitta, what you say should be informed by Bodhicitta. What you think about, what you allow your mind to ponder on, to entertain, should be in, uh, imbued, influenced by Bodhicitta. What, with the, the actions that you do, the kind of relating that you do with your environment, with other people, with other beings, it should be in, uh, informed by bodhicitta. This immense, inconceivable compassion and love. That's the relative aspect. And then the umbrella of that is an understanding of reality. Some kind of understanding of reality, at least that the separation that I'm experiencing is an illusion. The separation that I'm experiencing between me and others, that's, a, that's an illusion. At least have that kind of state of mind in your, in your head, okay? Now, when you have that as the, your practice, 
then the six perfections, the six paramitas become simply different ways of implementing bodhicitta. When you understand that, then you, you can understand from the perspective of bodhicitta, what is patience, which is the third paramita that we are, uh, uh, we are on right now. And if you're an actual bodhi, bodhi, bodhisattva and you've reached what is referred to as the path of seeing, you've seen the true nature, you've had a direct encounter, direct experience of the true nature of reality. That is, you did the meditation I, I told you to do <laughs> a moment ago. You kept relaxing, kept relaxing. You allowed the true nature of reality to just, ah, oh, see, I was, always, I was always here. Okay? You, you didn't have to rub two sticks together and then boof. The nature of reality is made manifest. I was already here. You just had to relax. And eventually, in, in relax, relax, relax. And whatever is appearing, you say, oh, I see directly the true nature, the luminous ground out of which this experience is emerging. Oh, that sounds cute, doesn't it? The luminous ground out of which this experience is emerging. The luminous ground out of the empty, non-conceptual, luminous ground out of which this anger is arising, this luminous, the luminous ground out of which this boredom is arising, this luminous ground out of which my anxiety is arising. That is, you're not pushing your anxiety away, you're not in pushing your anger away, but you're allowing it to show it. What, are, what, is, what is the power of reality that is allow, that is making you real, a real experience. And you're able to have that direct experience with that undertone, with that, found, with, with that fundamental, with that luminous ground. Then as a bodhisattva, that entering, into that entering into that experience with a mind imbued already with great compassion. The reason I want to encounter, make this encounter is because I care deeply for all beings. And I want to help them in the ultimate way that I can help. With that state of mind, you enter into that, in, into that uh, field. Then when you emerge out of it, then, you call, you're, then you're, you're an Arya bodhis, bodhis, you're an Arya Bodhisattva. Meaning now you're grown up. <laughs> you're no longer a little kid. You're no longer a child uh, as well as, uh, 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 beings are concerned. You're no longer a child, a childish being. Now you're a mature being. You're a teenager, but <laughs> just turned 18, but you're now mature. Now you can take, start taking greater and greater responsibility. Okay. At the first level, what you perfect is generosity. Why do you perfect generosity? Because you've seen directly that separation Ownership is, on the, is, a, is, a, is an illusion. There's really no being depriving yourself of anything and then making someone else the owner of it. That doesn't ultimately exist. So giving and generosity becomes for you. It doesn't bother you. It's, it, it's, it, it's not a, a, a sacrifice for you anymore. And because you've mastered that, that is you have mastered that the illusion of separation is an illusion and you're closing the gap of this, of this, of doing away with this illusion, then ethics becomes a for you. Now, your compassion is compelling you to act. Your understanding of nature of reality is compelling you to act. Whatever you do is in line with the nature of reality. Whatever you do is in line with, with what is beneficial for others. Even though on the appearance of it, it may seem to be uh, even in, uh, in there, there's a passage where the Buddha said, uh, if I can find it, uh, never mind. <laughs> I'll paraphrase this time. Uh, where the Buddha said, it says that uh, uh, you practice patience so perfectly that you become skillful as to, ah, this is the time when this will be effective. 
then I will apply because it will be beneficial. It will help others get closer to their true nature, help others get closer to liberation, help others get closer to being free from nonsense pain, pain, pain that doesn't have to exist, suffering that doesn't need to exist because of the nature of things and the nature of reality, because of the true nature of reality. And also, here it is, you also know when is the time to admonish someone? When is the time to be uh, harsh and wrathful with someone? And you're not being harsh and wrathful because you're angry, you lost your mind, but you see it as this is the skillful way to actually help this person. Like a parent disciplining their child out of love for the child, not because they can't stand the child and they want the child to suffer, but rather out of motivated by the concern for the child's welfare. And they see this is a skillful way to help the child better, okay? And what is it that you're making the child endure in the moment? It could be difficult. It could be a, a, a difficult thing. You're making the child endure. And this is where we get to patience here, okay? So patience, what is it? When we understand what patience is, it will help us to practice patience better. The only reason that we have problem with patience is because we don't really understand it. What is patience? Why should we practice patience? And because we've tried and we see that we failed, then there must be some misunderstandings that we have about patience. There must be some wrong ways of practicing patience that we have practiced. So what is not the uh, patience. So these are the, you could say, three things to really uh, come to a, a definite um, conviction about so that we can effortlessly practice patience, okay? Uh, and this is from, uh, from the same uh, treasury of Mahayana Sutras, Maharatna Kutra Sutra. Uh, in, this is uh, a chapter, The Lion's Roar of Queen Srimala. The Lion's Roar. The Lion's Roar means, uh, the Lion's Roar means, uh, you are so established in truth, you can proclaim it without fear. Okay? That's what, it, that's what, that's what the Lion's Roar means. Okay? And who can make the lion's roar when you're firmly established in truth? Okay, so that means Queen, Mala, Queen Shrimala is uh, uh, somebody who has reached, at least who has seen the true nature of reality re directly, and now she can make the lion's roar, or should we say the lioness roar? <laughs> I just found out recently uh, in the kingdom of, in the, in the realm of lions, Lions aren't really kings. <laughs> they have no power. It's the, it's, the, it's the lioness who really has power. <laughs> and the lioness, you know why they have power? The, the lion are solitary beings. They're ego-driven. The lioness are group-driven. So when the lioness think, hey, King, it's time for you to leave. <laughs> the lion has no, no say but to leave or the lion will be demolished. <laughs> so it should be the lioness roar. <laughs> okay. All right. So here it is. This is the Buddha describing, okay, what is the, what is the practice of the perfection of patience? Now listen carefully. Let me put on my glasses so I can, so you can... So I can read it properly. Where did you go? Where, where'd you go? <laughs> For those sentient beings who can best be matured by patience. Let's stop there at that, uh, that phrase. Why is the Bodhisattva practicing patience? Not for the Bodhisattva, but because it is a means to help others. Okay? You practice patience because it is a means to help others. Okay? So for those sentient beings who can best be matured by patience, who are those, who are those beings who, who, 
who, who can do that? Who, 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 the Bodhisattva of embrace the true Dharma, the Bodhisattva who is free of ill will, intend only to benefit. What, what, what do they do? They bear rebukes, scoldings, insults, outrage, slander, libel, annoyance, and harassment with the utmost patience, even without their faces changing color in the slightest. In this way, they bring those sentient beings to maturity in accordance with their inclinations to establish them firmly in the true Dharma. What, is about, what, is about, what does it mean by the true Dharma? Whatever it is that will really help you get out of suffering, that's true Dharma. True Dharma is not because it is written in some texts that the people who call themselves Buddhists are calling Dharma is true Dharma. That's not what, that's not what makes up something true Dharma, okay? As a matter of fact, Pamunka Rinpoche recently in 19th century saw some books that said they were true Dharma. I said, oh, according to my, according to my, <laughs> according to my own reasoning, this thing calling itself true Dharma is no true Dharma just because it calls itself true Dharma, okay? And I, uh, I think I remember uh, reading this back in, back in ancient India. And this is for those of you who are trying to hold, uphold the precepts. Do not, this, do not have any respect for the slightest writing on a piece of paper or you will be destroying the Dharma. <laughs> okay, here's the example. That, I'm, uh, that, that, that is not exactly what it means to disparage the Dharma, okay? When the thing is something that actually will help others get rid of their suffering and you are mistreating it, that is uh, disparaging the Dharma. It's not just because it's written on a piece of paper, therefore it's something sacred, okay? And here's the example. And this was in Pabong Gai Rinpoche Liberation in the, uh, in the palm of our hands, when he was giving a story, uh, maybe him, maybe someone else, but anyway, it's, it's from the Lamrim teaching, uh, where ancient, in ancient India, Scholars, great scholars, that is people who were steeped into uh, these, are the, these are the accepted words of the Buddha and we are writing them. When someone writes a commentary, okay? Someone writes a commentary to explain the words of the Buddha. That means the words of the Buddha are already in that commentary, right? So the words coming from the sutra are in that commentary. That's what the commentary is about. But because that person misunderstood what, what, what was written in, in the, in, in what, what, what was written and is, and in their misunderstanding will be mislead others. How did, they, what did they, what did they do with that book, with that text <laughs> to show that, sorry, we, we, you can't publish this. They tied the book to the tail of a dog and have it run in the town. Talk about disrespecting a book. Now you're telling me these great scholars were so stupid, they didn't know that they were disparaging the Dharma. Words of the Buddha were in those texts. And yet they say, oh, you're misleading people. This is not true Dharma. To prove to you that it's not true Dharma, I'm gonna have a dog <laughs> drag it around behind its, <laughs> on its tail, okay? What am I talking about that? Never mind. <laughs> true Dharma, okay? To establish them firmly in true Dharma, this is called the paramita of patience. Probably my story now about the dog with the tail and the, and the books tied to its tail, probably forgot. What was he talking about again? <laughs> the perfection of patience. Okay, I mean, there's so much to say. Now let's, I'm not gonna go into, uh, okay, this kind of patient, that, that kind of patients, the, this one has five <laughs> subcategories and this five subcategory has 10 kind of subcategories. And then you end up, what was he talking about? I'm supposed to practice patience. I don't know what he's talking about. Okay, <laughs> but this is it. What is patience? Why should you practice it? And what is not patience? Now let's talk about the, uh, uh, Liz talked about the kind of patience where you're not able to, you can't, you, you, uh, patience in, in not being able to deal with time. Uh, 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 you could say uh, in, uh, 
a dysfunction with, I love that word dysfunction, a dysfunction in relating with time, okay? You can't wait, you know, uh, uh, the thing you, you just press, I order, and then within, in some places, within four hours, you get the thing delivered, uh, delivered to your door, okay? So that sort of fosters a, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait, okay? So there's ty- that time, a dysfunction in relating with, in terms of time. But also in uh, uh, the, the patience that is talked about mostly, especially in the commentaries and the Lamrim Chenmo and so forth, is, is a, 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 what the Buddha was listing here, uh, not being able to bear rebukes, scoldings, basically being harmed either through words or physically being harmed or in some way being, your reputation being harmed, not being able to bear that, okay? Now, when someone is harming you, there's a part of you that wants to respond properly, right? But unfortunately, because we are so uh, used to uh, a dysfunctional, there's that word dysfunctional again, a dysfunctional way, by dysfunctional, I mean doing the very thing that enhances the very problem you're trying to get rid of. Okay, that's a dysfunctional way, right? It doesn't really solve the problem. So there's the intention, I want to solve this problem. I am being harmed. Of course, that intention to, to stop, the, to, uh, to address that problem, that intention is correct. That intention is, you're, in your, you're thousand percent correct for wanting to address that. The thing is, what we are used to, what we are habituated to as a means of addressing it is a dysfunction. And that, this, and that dysfunctional way of dealing with being harmed, that's what is referred to as being impatient. And what do we do? And I'm gonna use a, uh, I'm gonna use a, a phrase to describe a word. I'm not gonna use the word, I'm gonna rather use a phrase to describe it. Yeah, we have time. <laughs> and the phrase I'm gonna use is this, or, or the explanation of it. A misguided attempt to get rid of what we perceive as the cause of pain, the cause of suffering. A misguided attempt at addressing or getting rid of what we perceive to be the cause of a suffering. That's how we usually respond when we are being harmed. That's how we are habituated to respond. And that phrase is what we usually call anger. And the reason that I, I don't want to use the word anger, but rather describe it that way. So anger, understood this way. But when we just use the word anger, within the anger, there, is, there are two things in there. There's the intention to address something, right? There's a harm being done, there's suffering being perpetrated, and we want to respond to it. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? And then we feel this energy is bubbling up within us hey, respond to this, there's harm being done, okay? But because we are, have been, we are so used to being misguided, to misunderstanding, we take that intention, we give it to our ignorance. We say, ignorance, take care of this. And usually what we call anger, that's what we see. We see this, this wanting to respond And the way we see it, we see anger. So because anger is mostly associated with this dysfunctional way of trying to respond, so the term anger sort of uh, uh, sort of become the all-encompassing way of, of uh, dysfunctionally responding to being harmed, okay? But if 
as you are practicing, you may come to know that in that anger, without the dysfunction, there's this attempt to address something, address a misjust, uh, uh, injustice, address uh, an attempt, uh, 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 someone who's in the, in the process of harming, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. That's where we get confused because we confuse those two things as one and the same. So when we hear, stop being angry, it shouldn't be do not address this problem, but rather don't, do not allow this dysfunctional way of addressing your problem to continue, but address your problem in a way that actually helps get rid of the problem. Okay, so when, ang when the word anger is more on that line, then anger is needed. When, when, when this, because what anger calls from us is there's the, there is the thing that is causing suffering. If that is true, then the intention of anger to destroy it, to get rid of it is true. But because ignorance is guiding us, it's pointing in the wrong direction. So we are directing destructive power in the wrong direction. Because we are directing power in the wrong direction, we don't get rid of the problem. We only make the problem worse. Okay? So impatience is continuing allowing a dysfunctional way to respond to continue. Patience is beginning with a recognition. Ah, most of my life, at least this life, I don't know about many lives, maybe I'm not sure about this many live things, but at least in this life, as long as I remember, I've not really been able to get rid of my problems because my problem keeps coming up. So I must, the way that I'm used to dealing with problems, there must be something wrong with it. There must, at least there's some, there's something unskillful about it. That is, it is not really getting to what it's, it's promising, okay? So not allowing, not permitting this dysfunctional way of responding to continue, that's practicing patience. So basically, we are so used to the momentum, what we call, I'll just call it dysfunctional anger, okay? Let's call it that way, dysfunctional anger. We are so used to the momentum of this functional anger to come up. Okay, I'll take care of it for you. Uh, just, just sit back. I'll take care of it for you. Okay. We are so used to that, that it's so automatic. At first, the way, when we practice patience, what we have to do is to hold ourselves back. And when we are holding ourselves back, and this is what, and uh, we may see ourselves doing, wait a minute, then we draw this messed up conclusion. Patience is allowing evil to continue. Patience is tolerating evil. Then we come up with these very strange things. Don't be patient with this, be patient with that. Don't be compassionate to this, but you can be compassionate to that. These very strange conclusions that we draw because we completely misunderstand what patience is supposed to be. It is holding back the dysfunctional habit energy that throws, that, that only makes things worse. It's holding back. Okay? Now, what about the evil that is happening? Are we supposed to allow that to continue? Is that practicing patience? The person that is scolding, rebuking, and all these kinds of things, slandering you, you're supposed to let them continue to do that? Is that what patience means? Patience means 
When someone is harming you, don't be stupid. Don't continue to be stupid. That is, don't, don't, don't. Uh, there is a real situation taking place here. You're being slandered, yeah. You're being harmed, yes. And, you, and, and this is something that has to be taken care of in a real way. Don't let ignorance come in and mess things up. Take care of it in the way that will really take care of it. And how are you gonna be, uh, what will be, what will help you? Bodhicitta, compassion, a sense of understanding, at least separation is a delusion. Even though I, haven't, I don't see anything beyond that, all I'm seeing is the separation, but at least I'm, I'm not fully buying into it, at least at the, at the, at least at the intellectual level, okay? You connect with your compassion. The person who is harming you, make yourself have compassion for them. That person is completely deluded. They've completely bought into this ignorant idea that we are separate. You are harming me. Therefore, I must stop you from harming me. I'm going to harm you first before you, before you do something to me. That person has completely bought into that, into that ignorance. Now, why are we going to just jump into the mud with them? Why jump into the mud with them? They're in a quicksand. They're, 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 they're uh, drowning. We we'll jump into the quicksand with them. Let's drown together. Ignorance, got, ignorance has gotten them already. They're complete slave to ignorance. That's why they're harming you. They actually believe that there, there you are and I can harm you and, and, and that's it. So they're bought into the lie. They're slave to ignorance. So do not let ignorance now come and take you into it also. Have compassion for that person. What does it mean to have compassion for that person? Let that person continue in their evil? No. Find a way to skillfully make them stop. And what will be that skillful way? Compassion will, will guide you. Compassion will look at that person. Okay, according to what I perceive here, according to what, I, what that person propensities are, I should slap this person. And that person receiving that slap that slap because of that person who would that person, and you're not slapping the person because ignorance is telling you, but because wisdom is telling you, because that slap will have that person, whoa, I was being stupid. I was completely taken over by ignorance. Thank you very much for slapping me. And for someone else, just ignore them. That's, maybe that's what compassion, maybe that's what uh, wisdom is telling you to do, is guiding you to do. Then you ignore them. And the person says, oh, I was trying to get attention, and, but I'm not getting attention through that. The person is ignoring me. So then they'll think of a different way, they, or a different way of, of tr trying to get your attention, okay? So let your compassion, let your whatever measure of wisdom you have, let it guide you as to what is, what is the way of, of relating to there's something here that I must attend to, okay? And I may not at this very moment, I'm, it could be I am so uh, accustomed, so used to being driven. I'm such a slave of my habit of impatience that is trying to address a situation with ignorance, with misunderstanding. I'm so used to that. In other words, I'm so angry, stupidly angry, that I'm blind. I can't see anything. I cannot even think of compassion. I cannot even think of, of wisdom. All I can think about, all I'm trying to, all, I'm, all I can think about is say something very mean, do something very mean because I'm convinced that's the thing that will help me with, with, with my pain right now that is, that, I'm being, that, is, that, is, that is being inflicted upon me. We are so caught up in that, that we cannot, at that moment, come up with a skillful way to, to really address that thing. Then admit it. That's it. This is, this is my reality right now. I cannot, 
I cannot come up with a skillful way to deal with this person. I'm just gonna find another way, but not right now, okay? When we, and there's a kind of a, there's another ignorant way of dealing with, with thinking you're practicing patience when you're not really practicing patience. When you're actually doing is you're harming yourself. When anger comes, you better pay attention to it. Never suppress anger. Anger arises from a conviction, a buddy, you need destructive energy to deal with this. And here's the destructive energy. And if you don't direct this destructive energy somewhere, it's going to destroy you holding it. That's why we, ah! that's why we say things, mean things, do mean things, because that's trying to channel this destructive energy that we have tapped into. So what should we do? What do I say? Do not suppress anger. When I say do not suppress anger, I'm not talking about blow your top. Blowing your top is actually distracting yourself from the anger. All those things that we, we, we think we are doing out of anger, we think they're expressions of anger, they're not expressions of anger, they're distractions from anger. Okay? We have a conviction, there's destruction, taking, uh, harming is taking place. The cause of the harm must be stopped. What is, what is that Bodhisattva is doing? What is an Arha doing? Putting a stop to the cause of suffering. And here you are, you, have, you believe you have found the cause of suffering. Of course, you're supposed to destroy it. But ignorance gives you that information. Ignorance told you this is the cause of your suffering. So if you direct that destructive energy towards a wrong cause, then you're just putting yourself into more trouble. Okay? So what do I mean? Do not suppress anger. Have a conversation with your anger. What is really going on? Why are you calling upon this destructive, destructive energy? What in you is convinced? What are you seeing that is a trigger. What are you seeing that is giving you conviction? A, your destruction is about to happen. Do something about it. Destroy the cause that is going to that is destroying you. Get rid of it. But then, since it is a perception that the cause of my suffering is right here, and if that perception is wrong, if I can show myself oh, this is, not the, this is not the cause of my destruction. This is not the cause of my suffering. Then whatever it is within us that called upon the destructive power to deal with it, it was, oh, all right, I thought, my bad, I'll take it back. <laughs> right? I mean, you're engaging in an argument with someone and you're getting all upset because you heard the person say something that person didn't say, but you're convinced the person said it. And then when the, paper con when, the, when the person convinces you, no, I didn't say that. What happens to that anger? Oh, sorry, I thought uh, that's what you said. And it, that means whatever within us that thought, A, the cause of your suffering is right there. So, oh, my, my mistake, that my cause of my suffering is not there anymore. Then that, that part of us is now convinced it is not there. Then it's okay, I take back the energy. Otherwise, it's, the energy is just going to circulate you know, within your system, looking, looking, looking to destroy, because that's its, that's its purpose, to destroy. And if it's not properly directed, then it will just destroy you. That's why many wise people in many different... Uh, uh, many different uh, uh, Traditions say that uh, the anger destroys more the person who is angry than the, than the person that you're angry with. 
Okay. It's like uh, someone is harming you, and then on top of the person harming you, you're harming yourself with this stupid anger. All right. So do not suppress anger. When anger comes, understand that there's a part of you that is convinced that it is needed. Have a conversation with that part of you that is convinced that it is needed. So that part of you with somehow able to tap into somewhere and get this destructive energy, that part of you knows how, how to put it back. It will put it back properly rather than having it circulate in your system, causing you all kinds of physical ailments. Okay. And it will cause you, it will cause you, uh, 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 it will damage your health, your physical health, as well as your mental health to have this destructive energy, which is supposed to be directed properly, improperly, just going around loose. Okay. So do not suppress anger, but rather go to, the source within you that is calling the anger to show it how this thing that it has identified as the cause of your suffering is not a cause of your suffering. Okay. And what will help you with that is at least understand when we are holding anger with ignorance, there's the conviction, there's a separate thing out there that when it is making contact with me here, it is causing me here to be diminished. That itself, you already know at a superficial level, that is just completely wrong. It's a delusion, a delusion is causing us to act, to call upon a destructive power. When wisdom and this destructive power is not something that uh, should never be tapped into, it should be tapped, be, be tapped into every once in a while. It should be tapped into by wisdom. It is wisdom and compassion that should call forth this power because they see rightly what is the true cause of suffering and that they will direct it towards the true cause of suffering. And when it is directed towards the true cause of suffering, everyone will benefit. You will benefit, others will benefit. They will, no one will be destroyed. No one will be harmed when wisdom and compassion are holding onto this destructive power. And when that is happening, that is what is referred to as wrathful compassion. Compassion, becoming very wise, now can wield the, the power. Now, don't be egotistic, <laughs> thinking, ooh, that's a nice sword you got there, uh, wrathful compassion. Let me play with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Your ego is going around. Ah, oh, that's misjustice. Let me destroy you. <laughs> you are harming the environment. Let me destroy you. <laughs> You're raising my taxes. <laughs> Let me destroy you. <laughs> Because I'm wielding the power that wisdom holds. I'm being wrathful, compassion. Don't fool yourself, okay? <laughs> don't, let, don't let stupid anger fool you to make you think that it is compassion when it is not. It's just stupid ignorance, okay? All right. So I'm trying very much to speak about uh, patience in a way that is that you can begin to at least appreciate what patience is. And you will have to revisit with yourself, what is patience anyway? 
and try to come up with a way that it makes that it makes sense, where it doesn't end up being uh, allowing evil to go rampant. That's not what patience is. As a matter of fact, as a bodhisattva, you allow evil to continue. You are being unethical. If you don't stop someone who is harming themselves and especially who is harming others, you are being unethical. What is the aim of the Bodhisattva? To make sure everyone becomes free. And here is someone who is entangling themselves further into samsara. The very existence of your being as being a Bodhisattva is to help them. And here they are going deeper into samsara and you're allowing it. And allowing it doesn't mean that, well, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to stop you anyway. No. I see what, from what I'm understanding, you're causing harm. I do not have enough wisdom. I don't even have enough compassion <laughs> to, be, to know what is the skillful thing to do. But out of the the little bit of compassion that I'm able to wield, I have the little bit of wisdom that I'm able to have. This is what I pray to have more wisdom and compassion for later. And this is what I can do for now. And you do it. And you try to do it with compassion, as much compassion as you can. Compassion for the person who is doing the thing and compassion for, the, for, for those who are the victim of that person. You must have compassion for all of them. A bodhisattva doesn't hate someone who's causing harm and has love for those who are being harmed. That's not a bodhisattva. That's just not an ordinary person. A bodhisattva has love for everyone, has compassion for everyone. Okay? A bodhisattva, the fear, the dread of a bodhisattva is to be disconnected from anyone, especially through their own actions. Because that undermines the very reason of their existence to be disconnected from anyone. That is the worst thing a Bodhisattva could happen to a Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva dreads this. So the Bodhisattva doesn't have hatred for anyone. The Bodhisattva understands that everyone is under their slaves to their karma, their slaves to their afflictions. They have no idea what they're doing. So they're, they're children, they're babies. And with this understanding, you can have patience for them when they're harming you. Because they don't really contemplate, hmm, there you are. I'm going to see clearly the end of that. No, they're to their afflictions. They're slaves to their afflictions. And just like when you were like them, a slave to your afflictions, and the tremendous suffering that it brought you, it allows you to have empathy for them. Because you've seen them engage in the very thing that you knew cause you great suffering and you want to help them okay so that intention i must there's something that must be honored at least with a there's nothing there's not that I, I don't know what to do i wish i could do i i wish yes it's time I oh, know. I it's it's just that um, your mic is very staticky at times, so uh, we missed a few words here and there, which is very uh, unfortunate. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. It's scratching. Maybe it's not scratchy, just static. Okay. All right. Um, and it is time. Um, Impatient, 
being patient is not allowing evil in whatever degree that is to, to run rampant. That's not what patience is. But rather, in the beginning, it is holding ourselves back from the habit of impatience, which is a stupid way of trying to address something, a, 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 a stupid way of trying to address being harmed, a stupid way of trying to address uh, like the waiting, for example. Oh, what is going on? Why can't you wait? It's like, I'm convinced I'm going to melt if I, if I wait. And I'm trying to prevent myself from melting, from dissolving into oblivion. In a sense, that's what motivating us, motivating us where we can't wait. There's this conviction, stupid conviction in ourselves that somehow we're going to be, we're going to dissolve by waiting. Uh, if I don't get that, uh, if I don't get that uh, rubber ball, rubber ducky in uh, <laughs> by tomorrow, my entire existence will have no meaning. <laughs> and that's, that's why we are impatient. It's, that, it's that conviction that is driving us. So whenever we are impatient, understand that is a very strong, stupid conviction driving us. Okay? And we are, when we are practicing patience, deliberately have the wish, I want to address this problem in a way that is really addressing this problem. Not just some stupid way that I've been doing in the past, not, not some bandage way of taking care of it. I want to really address this and connect with your compassion, connect with your whatever measure of wisdom that you have. Uh, and to really go into this, in a way where we really cover each one of them. Of course, each one probably would take like six classes for each perfection, right? But I'll summarize it with this from Ratna, the Maha Ratna Kuta Sutra. I say, it is superb to be patient, but patient is apart from views. That is, patient does not inherently exist for those of you who are close, close to that. And by nature does not arise. That is, by nature does not inherently arise. There is really nothing to cause anger. What does that mean? Remember, the stupid anger, it comes up because it believes there is separate self. There is separate, there is inherent existence. So what he's saying that there is really no such thing, which is really the cause of stupid anger. To realize that, that is supreme patience. Okay. So when you really understand reality, that very understanding of reality will make you patient because whatever you do will be in alignment with the true nature of reality. How to be patient? Be real with what's going on. Remember what's being real, what's going on means. I'm angry. Anger is real. Deal with it in a way that is, that, that, with what really called the anger in the first place. I wanna deal with this situation. I wanna deal with this problem. So deal with it in a way that is really dealing with it, not, not in a way that is distracting us from it, yelling, saying meanful, mean things, all that is just distracting ourselves from the real problem. Okay. And lastly, forbearance, courage. These are synonyms of the, the parameter of patience. Uh, oh, and this is the very last thing I really wanted to say. Remember that story I gave about you make the child experience something difficult in the present moment. So training the child to bear difficulties 
that will eventually, by this bearing this difficulty, will reap a, 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 a something beneficial later. So when you are suffering, when you're able to in, endure it, not letting the evil go, okay? Now you're in pain and there's nothing you can do right here, right now to get rid of the pain, whether it's physical pain, mental pain, whatever pain, endure it. That very enduring it will give you the strength that you need. And this is why, because you are a bodhisattva in training, you need tremendous power and strength. It is the practice of patience that will lead you to eventually arrive at this tremendous power. Okay? And eventually, you will get rid of this stupid tendency to experience pain. And you being patient will not even be a, a, a term anymore. It will just be your nature because there's no enduring anything. You're just living that nature. Okay, that's it. Bye. <laughs> uh, anybody has a, any questions? <laughs> I hope I covered enough to make you be able to go home and practice. And sorry about this thing. I'm going to get rid of it. I have another mic. Just got it. Don't know how to plug it in. So that's why I'm using this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, my intention in, in talking about the things is to talk about them in a way that makes you feel they are things that you can actually apply not just some very nice theory that sounds nice on paper. And when you actually try to apply this nice theory in your life, it doesn't seem to make sense. It makes sense, makes sense in some situations, but it doesn't make sense in other situations. And it's an evil for you to avoid. Somebody's doing something to harm you, they're harming themselves, and you're practicing patience, allowing them to continue in this very bad habit, you're being a very bad bodhisattva. Yeah, that's not patience. That's just being coward. And I'm a victim, and I'm a, and I know that very well. I don't want to hurt their feelings. Get over yourself. The thing to do is to help them and be uncomfortable, bear the discomfort of stopping them. Holding compassion in your heart. Okay, let's meditate. Everybody, you're going to meditate? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, that's good. Body's already got the message. It's already uh, in that state of. Take a nice deep breath. And with that breath, as you let go, let yourself return to that space. Begin to re-experience re -experience the calm, the pleasantness, the clarity, the radiance, the focus in your body, in your breath, in your mind, rejoice. Think of yourself and understand that it is a composite of many things which are not me, that we are calling me. 
I'm not my finger, but my finger, I need my finger to be me. I'm not my legs, but my legs need, need my, I need legs to be me. So in the same way, the right hand will help the left hand because it is me helping myself. Extend that sense of me, us, to all of us sitting here in meditation. Seeing us in your room, in your space, in a circle. And that sense of us manifests as a bright presence in the center of our circle. And there's a ray of light coming from it, touching our hearts. It is empowering us and we are empowering it. And as a sense of us, it becomes stronger and stronger. That bright light is expanding, expanding, expanding. And as it expands, whatever it envelops becomes us. Everyone in your home, everyone in your neighborhood, your pets, everyone in your country, everyone on the planet, the mountains, the sky, the rivers, the oceans, every being, everything is just like the right hand and the left hand. It's us. So there's no Republicans, no Democrats, it's us. No liberals, no conservatives, it's us. And when you feel that same urgency that the right hand feels to help the left hand, you feel that same urgency to help the ocean. It's helping me, it's helping us to help the sky, to help the mountains, to help the trees, to help the, the dogs, to help the cats, to help the fish, to help the Republicans, to help the Democrats, to help the liberals, to help your neighbor. Now that vision has impressed our mind, we no longer need the vision of a bright light engulfing the entire world. It is not the bright light that made it so. It was just a way for us to see something that was already there. So the bright light begins to shrink in size. And as it shrinks, whatever it touched, it leaves with a shimmer of light, a brightness. It comes back again to our very center. And as it stays there in our very center with the line of light connecting our hearts to it, now it dissolves completely into the light connected to our hearts, into, our, into us. And we have that conviction. By helping me, I help us. By helping us, I help me. And get ready to come out of the meditation before we do that. Whatever gifts you may have received from this teaching, from this talk, from this, dedicate this beautiful energy to address whatever concerns you may have. And let's make a dedication for greater sentient beings. Gewadi Kyokan Sunam Yeshe Tokdon Shin 
And get ready to arise, take a nice deep breath with the intention to arise. Ah. And deliberately, consciously reconnect with the immediate surroundings through your sense of touch, sense of hearing, sense of sight, deliberately, consciously engaging. Ah, that's, those are colors, those are shapes, that's light, that's shadow. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much, Pinso. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining the live session here and those tuning into the recordings wherever you are. Um, please make your offering for this class, which you can send directly to Pinso's Venmo or through ongoing patronage through Patreon. Uh, just to remind you, Punsok's uh, Venmo name has changed. It's now at Tupton Punsok, all one word. Um, and also, I wanted to mention that Punsok is still making time for private sessions. Uh, he has limited availability during this holiday month. And uh, just a heads up, uh, the structure of these private sessions may change in the new year. So you can schedule your session in the link in the chat. And uh, wish you all meaningful practice. We'll meet again in two weeks to receive the fourth paramita of perseverance.